Amen. 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 You guys can be seated. Good morning. My name's uh, my name's Scott, and uh, I just got a tan this morning. You know, <laughs> if you're new here, I'm not. My name's not Scott. He's the head pastor. My name's Aaron. I'm a I'm a pastor here at Sunlight. I do some of the stuff in the background, a bunch of tech stuff. It's all really nerdy. Um, we just want to welcome you to Sunlight. If it's your first time. Uh, here with us this morning, we want to let you know that we're a church that believes that we need to know Jesus, make Jesus known, and live a Jesus life. And we reach the central, central part of our worship service where we open this up and we hear and we listen from God and see what, what is he saying to us, right? We're reading this book, this called the Bible, but uh, we also believe that the Bible is reading us, that God is telling us something, that he's alive and he's living today and he has something to say to each and every one of us. It's not less, just like a dry, dusty book of, of rules and principles and morals like a lot of people believe, but there's the living God who's speaking to each and every one of us in here today. And they've got, there's something for us, for everyone here. Uh, and so we believe that God has a claim on your life. We believe that, you know, God has something to say. We believe that you, you, your identity is wrapped up into who God is. And so we believe that we're doing that as a family here. So if you would, please just get acquainted with someone right next to you. Just, you know, turn to the best smelling person right next to you and just breathe them, breathe them in deep. Just, just a nice... Turn to the other guy and say, You're, you have only yourself to blame. You all, turn to the other one and maybe buy them some dove or something. It's normal. It's just church. It's just church, guys. Uh, today we'll be in Psalm 2, and we're, we'll be talking about how Jesus is king. If you guys would please pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you just uh, guard us against distraction this morning. Guard us, guard us against laziness and sleepiness. Guard us against our phones if we're not using them to your glory, God. I pray that your spirit would be with us, Lord, that you would, it would work with your spirit somehow and just help us to learn a little bit more about you, help us to draw a little closer to you, Lord. Uh, we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to waste your time. We don't want to waste our life here on earth, God, but that it's all wrapped up into you. God, I pray that you just do something miraculous this morning, that's something that I can't do or something that you can't do. God, I pray that you do miracles this morning and raise people spiritually dead to spiritually alive, God. I pray that if there's anyone in here walking in with baggage or some kind of weight, God, I pray that you'd let them know your yoke is easy, that those chains can be broken, that those shackles are gone, and that tied to you, God, we find freedom. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We believe that this whole Bible points to Jesus. A lot of people think that this is a dry, dusty book full of principles and morals and all that stuff. And if you believe that this morning, if you don't know what this Bible says, then uh, you're going to walk away from Christianity rather, you know, disillusioned, uh, kind of disappointed. Why? Because you could find morals and principles anywhere in the world. And, and people have lived throughout time with a whole bunch of different morals and moralities and principles and rules and stuff like that. It's not something that you have to do or don't do with, like, with your white knuckles and try to like, if I'm going to go to church, I've got to get right with God, right? There's no, that's no such thing. You and I can't do anything to get right with God. Actually, this book is not about morals or principles at all. Certainly, you could draw some of that stuff out of it, but it's not about it. It's really about Jesus Christ, the person and work of the living and reigning King Jesus Christ. That's what this book's about. And um, the reason why that's so important is because life change doesn't happen when you memorize a whole bunch of uh, uh, like morals and rules. But life change happens when you have a relationship with Jesus. I'll give you an example. I'm learning a lot about being a father, okay? I, I've got a one-year-old, about to have a zero-year-old in a little bit here. Really excited. Here's what I learned. My daughter, Tegan, uh, she... She, can, she can't be, I can't just let her be raised by just morals and principles. She doesn't need morals, more morals, more principles, more rules, more do this, more do that. She doesn't need that. She, she doesn't get acceptance from that. She doesn't get a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of safety, a sense of guidance. She doesn't get anything from rules. She needs a relationship. That's where she gets a sense of identity and purpose and value. That's where, I mean, like, that's why parenting is so important in, in someone's you know, in someone's upbringing. This is true for those of us who haven't experienced that and for those of us who have experienced it. I mean, it's just true, right? And so that's what I'm talking about is we're here to meet the living and reigning Jesus Christ. Uh, and that could, that could change someone's life radically. Now, let me ask you guys a question. 
Uh, why do we sing songs? Why do we sing songs, right? We just sang three songs, and they were great, and they were jamming out, right? Why do we sing songs? Why does music like, affect us so greatly? Well, I'm pro- probably there's a lot of reasons, but my favorite reason, or at least the main reason for me, is that music or singing songs can help us convey emotions or deeper meaning that words just can't express, right? When words, just saying a words isn't enough. Like, we need to express it somehow. We need to, there's like deeper levels. There's like higher meaning. There's like something in us that music can act, like expand and, and let out. I'll give you an example. Um, whenever I, uh, I don't know, whenever the song plays, I feel instantly cooler. Right? I don't know if you guys know this song. Fly me to the moon. Let me dance among the stars. Sorry. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. Yeah, I feel cool, right? Little Sinatra. I feel like I'm just like, right? I feel like the coolest kid on the block. Okay, okay, fine, fine. When I was, uh, when I was younger, whenever I'd have a crush, fall in love, right? I, I would sing multiple love songs, right? Like my heart would just, keep, just want to sing. I can show you the world. <laughs> Shining, shimmering. Sl- tell me you're a parent without telling me you're a parent, right? <laughs> Whenever I, my heart got broken, I'd be singing th- those songs too. So sick of love songs. <laughs> so sad and slow. So why can't I turn off the radio? Right? That's some, I was a little hood back then. But that's really, you know, that's some Neo, if you guys don't know. Um, but there is just something in us that, you know, when you go to the gym, you play a little more aggressive music. When you go to church or uh, like a, a wedding, you want to hear that soft, lovely music, you know, like, because it helps expand the depth of meaning of the human experience, right? That's just like what happens. And so uh, Hebrews, the Jewish people, had their own song list, so their, own, their own like playlist. And that's why we're going through a new so- sermon series called Psalms Summer Playlist. And the, the Psalms will be in. Uh, they had their own, you know, playlist of these songs, poems and stuff like that, that God, like, inspired in the artist of the day, David mostly, but a whole bunch of people, where they could express worship or sadness or joy to God with God. Does that make sense? Like, these songs help them express this stuff. Like, if you, if, like words wasn't just enough for them. Like, God allowed them to, to worship in, and it was just all over the place. It was sadness it was anger, it was grief, it was joy, it was hope. You know, so this is the whole playlist that, that we're going to be going through. And there's a particular set of psalms that were in, you know, 150 psalms. And these are called the messianic songs. And these are songs that the church in, throughout history have always said, hey, these are pointing to Jesus Christ. The psalms were usually written, or the, the psalms were written about 400 to 1,000 B.C., so a very, very long time before um, Jesus ever walked the earth. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Psalm 2. It is in, on page 769, and uh, we'll be talking about Psalm 2 here. So if you guys want to turn with me there. And while you're turning, like I said, there are psalms of uh, joy and sadness and stuff. This psalm was interesting. This was a psalm of what we would call coronation. Uh, this was a psalm where if Israel was anointing, creating a new king, crowning a new king, they would play this song, like they, there would be trumpets blaring, there would be confetti everywhere, there would be parades walking down the streets. It's kind of like if, if Port St. Lucie had a football team and we won the, the Super Bowl, right? We'd be like, yeah, Brady. No, I'm so like, like if it was in Tampa, right? Th- this is the scene. Like a new king is crowned and we're playing, this one is our jam. We're playing this song. So it was a very like, we were trying, they were trying to uh, express God's rule and reign in their lives. And so we could, we could read this like a piece of like a historical fact, right? Like, hey, yeah, you know, Zion is Jerusalem and the king was being installed and there are enemy nations around them. But this psalm is really about Jesus um, becoming king. And that's the title of the sermon today. Jesus is king. Turn to someone and say, Jesus is king. When I say king, I really mean the most significant, the guiding factor, the highest thought, the apex value, the thing that directs every other thing in your life. That's what I mean by Jesus is king, because there's a world out there that will tell you a whole bunch of other kings are there. Culture will tell you cash is king. Politicians might tell you the government is king. Reporters might tell you the media and the news is king. Social media might tell you being liked or envied is king. 
Postmodern thought might tell you sexu sexuality is king. Professors might tell you logic and reason is king. Netflix might tell you relationships are king. And we might so ourselves tell ourselves that I am king. But today we're talking about Jesus and how he is king. That there's a whole bunch of voices out there contradicting that. Ours included, but Jesus is king. So we have a game plan. Today we're going to talk about three points. One, how we hate the king. Two, the kingdom and the king. And three, the choice of the king. And so turn to someone and say, I'm fired up. Turn back and say, me too, Aaron, me too. Okay, so we're going to go in uh, Psalm 2, page 769. We're going to read the whole thing, and then we're going to break it down as we go. Oh, oh, sorry, wrong Psalm. <laughs> Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers uh, gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and, terif and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll rule them with an iron scepter. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For the wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So the first three verses show us how much we hate this king, right? Um, the psalmist is very uh, confused. He asks a rhetorical question, and he's like, why are people plotting against Jesus, plotting against God in vain. Like there's, no, this is word vain. Like it means nothing. It's fruitless. It's pointless. Like why do we do that in, you know, this rebellion in, in vain? Uh, and it doesn't matter how many people you gather up against God. You could gather up all the kings, all the celebrities, all the people of the world. And if we all collectively decide against what God wants for us, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. It's like a whole bunch of babies, like trying to revolt against you if you're watching them. It I'm the adult, right? You're just a baby. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? So we could, we could, every human in the world can gather up and say, we disagree with God, and it just simply doesn't matter. And you could see here that people see God's rule in their life as chains. This is why I wanted to make that uh, point in the beginning, like, hey, God's rule in our lives are not just this bound chain, like shackle on my neck. Like that's how people feel because they have a different view of what the Bible says. We would like, ah, oh, I got to do this. I don't have to do this. And there's this like back and forth, this to-do list that we have to do to please God. And that's just completely wrong. And here's why. The human, human rebellion to God's rule means death to us. Um, when I was, uh, when my daughter's walking around the street with me, she, when we were crossing the street, I wanted to hold my hand. Sometimes, She's a little rebellious. She goes, nope. <laughs> okay, 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 kid. Come here, right? Why? Because there's this rebellion in her heart. She wants to be free. But when we're crossing the street, her freedom will walk her right into an oncoming car. And that's what we're talking about here. Is a fish free when it tries to leave the water and walk on dry land? Is a train free when it tries to derail itself from the tracks and, and kind of shoot off into wherever it wants to go? Is a branch free when it snaps itself off from the, tree of, from the tree? And so are we free when we separate ourselves from the source of life, from God? That's not freedom. That's death. That's what we're talking about here. Tiki, get over here. <laughs> that's out of love, right? There's this protective walk that we need to walk with God, um, and, and that in itself is freedom. And, and our, our own wills, our own freedoms will chase us into death. No soul is free when it lives apart from its creator. Uh, there's this word here, anointed, right? Anointed is this weird word. In Hebrew, it was translated as the word we know as Messiah, Okay? So whenever they said, my anointed one, he's saying, my Messiah. And Messiah in Hebrew, if you didn't know, Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and the New Testament is written primarily in Greek. And when it's translated into the New Testament, it's actually the word Christ. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're not saying his first and last name. 
right? You're saying Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the king. And so when, we, when he's saying that, this is what all that leads up to, that Jesus is the king that is going to rule. Um, and, and, you know, that's just not his last name. <laughs> People, we're, we're not innocent or passive to God. Uh, the whole meaning of history is that uh, it's not nations warring against nations. It's nations warring against God. Um, there's a war out there. There's culture out there through all of time that hate God, that hate the king. I don't think I have to do a lot of convincing for this, right? Um, Caesar Augustus claimed he was king. Frederick Nietzsche claimed that uh, God was dead. And uh, Ariana Grande claims that God is a woman. So there's like a whole culture out there just totally in rebellion against God. There's, this is just flip the news on, right? Just flip on social media. There, it, you don't have to, there's no convincing for this one. This one's easy. Here's the hard part. It's hard to admit that we ourselves, in our own hearts, hate the king. That's the hard part. Aaron, I think you're wrong. I hear the objections in your brain, right? I think the average person doesn't hate Jesus. I think the average person doesn't hate the king. Like, hate is too strong of a word. I'm, I might be uh, dismissive, or I might forget about him from time to time, or a lot of people might just kind of not care. But let me ask you something. Is it easier to uh, get up and say, hey, you know what, I, uh, I don't believe, is it more socially acceptable to say, I don't believe in God in public square, or I do believe in God in the public setting, right? Which one's socially easier, right? And, and I, I would say that it's easier to say, oh, no, I don't believe in God. I'm not that bigot. I'm not that, you know, exclusive person. But if we look at what Jesus is saying as king, he says like a whole bunch of very offensive stuff. I have to be number one in your life. Number one means everything else comes second. Your family comes second. Your health comes second. I'm number one. Jesus said, be holy for I am holy. Be perfect. Don't ever sin. That's what he said. Jesus makes this claim that Oprah hates. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. This isn't like exclusive truths. You belong to me. The way you see your marriage must fall in line with what I say. The way you see your sexuality must fall in line with what I say. The way you, have, you spend your money must fall in line. It all belongs to me. Your family, your health, your future. I'm in con- total control of every dimension of your life. This should kind of like make us rise a little bit in our, in our seats. That someone, I mean, especially as like Western proud Americans, you know what I'm saying? Like, Someone is in control of me? I get a king? No, this is democracy. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is something that we really just don't really like. It's just kind of squirmy. And, and some of us might say, oh, no, that's Aaron. That's a primitive view of God. I believe in a God of love, right? Well, that's my point exactly. We are not okay with the God of the Bible, so we kind of manipulate the God of the Bible and try to reduce the stuff that it says in there and try to like highlight more of the good stuff that we like so that now we worship a completely different God, a God that reflects our best values instead of his best values. And this is a little painful because this reflects, the Bible says that we hate the king. This is what it means, that we hate the God. of There's something in us that naturally is like a, a hatred towards God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we hate the idea that we're not our own. So what is God doing when all of this happens? What is, what is God doing when the world rages? What, what is God doing when in our hearts we like hate God at different points? Like, we're not okay with that. Oh, I'll tell you what he is. Is he pacing the floor? Oh, Aaron hates me. Is he worrying? Is he sweating? Is he getting nervous? No, it says in verse 4, the, in, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. This is, this is crazy. That the struggle to overthrow God in our lives is like divine stand-up comedy to God. <laughs> like, uh, I, I was reminded of this uh, quick uh, story of when Michael Jordan was in his prime. He's playing for the NBA. Uh, uh, NBA like a uh, team owner challenged him to a one-on-one game. And, what, and Michael Jordan's response was just, he just laughed. He chuckled. Why? Because there was no, like, sense of fear. There's no sense of danger. There's no threat there. Like, you're just some, like, middle-aged dude who doesn't practice. You're going to challenge me to a one-on-one game of basketball? That doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? When Tegan gets angry at me and she wants something her opposite way, 
and she tries to like stare me down like she's a tough guy. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, this is, this is comical to me. And in the same way, when we try to stare down God, when we try to tell him what's right, when we try to tell him how to do things, it's like, what are you doing? What are you, <laughs> what are you even doing? But then check out this, like, check out this, like, harsh language. Hold on. But, hold on. Let me just drive this point a little home further. Look, there's zero threat to, to uh, God's crown, to God's kingship. He spoke creation to existence. He controls the fabric of time and space. Every star in the sky, every heartbeat in the chest, every cell, every molecule, every atom, they're all kept in place or dislodged because God wills it. In verse 5, he says, He rebukes them in anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Okay, don't miss the strong language here, okay? The, the, the point, so, so the point of view is that the writer is talking to God, like, hey, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? And then now the, the point of view shifts. God is now talking to his anointed one, King Jesus. And he's saying, you're gonna, you are my king, and uh, you're going to rule the nations, and uh, that is your kingdom. Now, he, said, he uses this strong language, and I, I came up with a sermon example. I'm not sure how well it's going to go over, but we'll see. So he uses strong language, and he says, I have um, the nations, if, if they rebel against you, they're like a clay pot. And I didn't have a clay pot, and I thought about it, smashing a clay pot on stage. But probably you guys in the front row would be, would be hurt. So a clay pot back in that day was something that was common, something that everyone saw all the time, someone that, that it was like kind of discarded, like no one really, but it was everywhere. So I have a soda can. And I don't have a rod of iron, but a rod of iron represented power, represented strength, represented authority. But I have a shovel. And he said that people who don't follow your rule, who don't follow your reign or authority, will be dashed to pieces like a clay pot is broken with a rod of iron. So, I don't want you to miss like the, the violence of this all. If you see like a, a flattened soda can on the road, maybe think of this lesson, right? Like that, that is violent, right? <laughs> like this is not like a funny, like he's talking about people here. This, <laughs> here's, here's what's, here's what's it. This is like a, this is a wildly offensive message that Jesus would punish someone. Just so I'm not mincing words, we're talking about hell right here. We're talking about punishment. We're talking about all the worst parts, right? Jesus talks about more, more about hell than he talks about heaven. He describes it more vividly than he does heaven. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed in, Warned against the absolute reality of hell. And this is why it's so offensive today. Because we don't want to believe that we deserve this punishment. I mean, who would, who would want to believe this message, really? Who, who really wants to believe that, that that's true? There's no, like, logical reason why this message should spread. There's no real, like, first of all, it's wildly offensive. That if I, dis, if I don't believe the same way you do, God, or the same way the Bible that that would happen to me. Wildly offensive. It's miraculously, like, hard to believe. Like, all this stuff that the Bible's talking about, <laughs> it's just hard to believe, really. And we just naturally hate it, right? We just, people just hate it. So how would this possibly grow and spread? How would the kingdom of God possibly take over the nations of the world? A lot of us in here don't know that we don't have the context of how we got into this room. And sometimes we just need a little reminder. God has been building his kingdom throughout the ages. And how, that, how does that relate to us? There's this huge meta-narrative, right? The God, God is bringing in his kingdom, and it started after Jesus was resurrected. Maybe I could just go through a timeline of events of how God is building his kingdom off of this kind of message. 42 AD, Mark goes to Egypt to preach the kingdom of God. 
49 AD, Paul goes to Turkey. 51 AD, Paul heads to Greece. 52 AD, Paul, Apostle Thomas heads to India. 54 AD, Paul heads to, on his third missionary journey. 174 AD, first Christians were reported in Austria. 280 AD, the first rural churches emerge in northern Italy. For the first time, Christianity is not strictly in the cities. 350 AD, 31.7 million, or, three, or 53% of the Roman Empire, claimed Christ as Lord. 432 AD, Patrick heads to Ireland. This is where we pinch each other in celebration. 596 AD, Gregory the Great sends Augustine and a team of missionaries to England to introduce the gospel. These missionaries are sent to Canterbury, and in two years, there are 10,000 converts. 635 AD, the first Christian missionaries arrive in China. 740 AD, Irish monks reach Iceland. 900 AD, missionaries reach, reach Norway. 1200 AD, the Bible is available in 22 different languages. 1498, first Christians are reported in Kenya. 1501, Pope Alexander VI grants the crown of Spain. All newly discovered countries in America is on one condition that the provision be made for religious instructions of native, native people. 50, 1537, Pope Paul III orders that the Indians of the New World be brought to Christ by this methodology, the preaching of the divine word and the example of a Christian life. 1554, 1,500 converts of Christianity were found in Thailand. 1549, the first missionaries arrived in Tampa Bay, and it was the first solely missionary attempt in Florida. 1565, the first church in Florida was founded in St. Augustine. It's also the oldest congregation. 1666, John Eliot publishes Indian Grammar, which is a, written, a book written to assist in the conversion work of the Indians. 1671, Quaker mis missionaries arrive in the Carolinas. 1743, David Graynard starts ministry in the North American Indians. 1770, freed black men uh, began to minister cross-culturally to American Indians. 1879, first settlers in Port St. Lucie came to, and started the first church in Port St. Lucie. 19, in the 1980s, the King's Church was founded by a bunch of retired snowbirds holding a Bible study in a strip mall in US 1. 1990, King's Church or, reorganized into Sunlight Community Church. 2021, the people of sunlight are still joining with Christians all over the world in all times of history, worshiping, singing, and bending the knee to King Jesus, and will continue to do so. <laughs> King Jesus and his kingdom cannot be stopped. This, this message is an unbelievable message. It's offensive. But there's something that happens that the the Spirit of God is pushing the kingdom forward, that there are people all over the world bending the knee to Christ. How is it that there have been so many parts of the world, nations being conquered by the message of Christ? He was born in a back country, hick village, child of a peasant girl, grew up an unknown as, until he was 30 in a carpenter's shop. Then for three years, he was a wandering homeless preacher. No books, no official power in office, never traveled further than 200 miles from his home. Like all the things that we associate with greatness, he never did. He was 33 when the public turned against him. He was turned into his enemies uh, and then staged on a straight, staged trial. He was publicly whipped and beaten and embarrassed. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. He died, in a, he died on the cross and then he was laid in a borrowed tomb. 20 centuries have come and gone, and he is still the central figure of the human race, the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the rulers that ever ruled, they have not directed the course of humanity just like Jesus Christ. 20 centuries later, people tried to erase him, critics tried to obliterate him, and contrary views tried to smother him, and somehow there are millions of people in the world where Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, still brings hope, still brings future, still brings a light in the darkness, courage in danger, and strength in times of need. Jesus was so fearsome that demons uh, and spirits cried out in terror against him, and that children were, felt so warm and, and, and uh, accepted by him that they wanted to play with him. He condemned sin with, the, with like the highest and the fieriest words, but he was also a friend of sinners. And he chose to save others, but he, ne he chose not to save himself. In three short years of active ministry, Jesus did more to shape humanity than every philosopher, every scholar, every leader, every wise man to ever live. There are more books written about him, there's more art depicted of him, and there's more wage wars waged over him than any other figure in human history. Malcolm Muggeridge says this, Behind the debris of these self-styled, sullen supermen, imperial diplomatists, there stands the gigantic figure of one person, because of whom, by whom, in whom and through whom alone mankind might still have hope, the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. So what do you do? What do we do with Jesus Christ? What's our response? 
Verse 10, therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate your rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction. And your way will lead to destruction, for his wrath can flare up in any moment. Blessed are the, all who take refuge in him. Okay, this phrase, there's this phrase, kiss the sun. This isn't just like this weird romantic thing, right? This is, what this is, is like back in that day, when a king would like conquer another king, that conquered king would be dragged into uh, the throne room, and the conquering king would be seated on a throne. And that king would be forced to kiss the feet, kiss the ring, like it's, a, it's an act of submission, Right? You ever see like you ever see that you know you know yes Godfather you know what I mean? like that's that's what that is right he, the, it's an act of submission to the King on high and he's saying hey you have this you have this choice kiss the sun you, you, the Bible doesn't miss, mince words here and I don't want to either I want to be super clear on what I'm on what I'm saying because this is what the Bible if you have an, a problem with what I'm saying if this is offensive you just have a problem with the Bible right this is just not me but here's what it is there's two options you could turn your life to Christ in submission, full authority, every dimension of your being to Christ. And what you'll find is unconditional love and safety and guidance and acceptance and forgiveness and a future. Right? That, that's, what we, that's why we turn to the book. Right? Like this, it's, it's, a, it's not morals or rules. It's a person. If you turn your life to Christ, that's what you'll find. But if you don't, you'll find destruction and rebellion. And we're talking about hell here. So we got to ask the question, right? Is Jesus king of your life? Or is he just a consultant? Right? Like, is he king over how you spend or don't spend your money? Is he king over how you raise or don't raise your family or your kids? Is he king over how you act or react in relationships? Is he king over your aspirations? Is he king over your future? Is he king over your emotions? Is he king over your, how you spend your thoughts and how you spend your time? Is he king over that? Or do you just go over there and consult with him? Because, you know, consultants. You could take it or leave it, right? But there's only, two, there's only two options, right? There's only two options here. Abraham Kuyper says this, There is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. This is what Psalms 2 is saying. Jesus is king. That is the fact. That is, that's what Psalm 2 is stating. But it poses a question to us. Have you accepted that? Now, you might be asking, what, what good does that do? Like, if okay, Aaron, I'm going to accept Jesus as king. Um, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for me? I'm glad you asked. In Acts, when Jesus died and he resurrected, the, the apostles were going around and they were, you know, they were preaching and they suffered a lot of persecution. And I'd just like to read to you a, um, a passage out of Acts, Acts 4, 23 through 31. It's kind of long, but if you want to listen, you, or you could turn there, go ahead. And um, they were just in prison. They were just questioned by the Sanhedrin, by these officials. And uh, this is what the apostles said. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. This was released from prison and reported all that the chief priests and elders had, to said, had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And then they quote Psalms 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. In Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed. They did what your, what your, uh, what your power and will had decided for should, them, should be beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy ser- servant Jesus Christ. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of, the God, of God boldly. There are people in here, so a lot of us, who walk through these doors today who, who have a lot of suffering, who have like baggage, who have hurt, who have pain, who are just dealing with stuff. And when the people of God are pressed, what do we do? Where is our hope? What is our comfort? And the church has always said these words, that our comfort in life and death is that we are not our own. 
even though we want it, even though we want to be our own. We are not our own, but we belong both body and soul to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That that is that is our comfort. That is our hope. Our hope is not in money. Hope is not in cars or relationships or career or sexuality or family. Our hope is not in more education or government or equality laws or the family structure or love, whatever that means today, or or technology. Our hope is not in intellectual advancements. Our hope is not in modernizing culture. Our hope is not in uh, philosophical constructs or tolerance or peace or United States of America. Our hope is not in resolutions that are made with guilt-ridden reforms. It's not in Calvinists trying to figure it all out. Not in Baptists trying to make decisions. Not in Pentecostals who are trying to feel God or Catholics trying to do enough good. Our hope is not in Donald Trump. Our hope is not in Joe Biden. Our hope is not in Aaron Mamouyak or Scott Vanderflug or DeSantis or Kumo or SCNN or Fox. Our hope is not in any of these things because all these things will fade and die away. Our hope is not in these, any of this. It's, it's in the ruling and reigning work of Jesus Christ. Here's why my hope is in him. It's because we don't have anything to fear if our hope is in him. We don't have to fear the Roman soldier with a sword in his hand. We don't have to fear the Roman, the emperor with a decree in his hand. We don't have to fear the false teacher with heresy. We don't have to fear the slave master with whips in their hand. We don't have to fear the clansman with a cross in his hand on fire. We don't have to fear a policeman with a gun in his hand. We don't have to fear a rioter with a sign in his hand. We don't have to fear a biased photographer with a camera on his hand. We don't have to fear a conceited teacher with a grade in his hand. We don't have to p- fear a corrupt politician with a pen in his hand, a terrorist with a detonator in his hand, corrupt authority with law in their hand, a doctor with a scalpel in his hand. We don't have to fear anything. We have nothing to fear because Jesus Christ has all authority in his hands. Jesus Christ has all power in his hands. He has all of time and creation. He's got the whole world in his hands, baby. Can we call Jesus king of our lives over every single thing in this world? Kiss the sun. Let's pray. Thanks so much for viewing this sermon. I hope you enjoyed it. For more content like this, please subscribe below and I'll see you next time.